After uh, 50 years, now we're going to be going and we're going to be going differently. Uh, we're going to go and we're going to go in a sustainable way. Because what we're trying to do is understand what it's like to live on another planetary body before we go on to Mars. Hello, welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Joel Achenbach. I cover science for the national desk of the Washington Post. And I'm very honored and thrilled today to have a chance to talk to uh, Vanessa Weish, the director of NASA's Johnson Space Center, a place I've visited many times and really enjoyed. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Great. Well, what a year for for NASA uh, with the Artemis mission. Congratulations on that. That seemed to go splendidly after a long delay trying to get, get the rocket off the pad. Uh, tell us about that mission if you can. Why? What did we learn from Artemis 1? Uh, and describe it for uh, our viewers. You know, what we learned, what exactly happened, and what's next? Oh, absolutely. And the mission was was wonderful. You know, as you said, um, you know, from a launch perspective, uh, we did have to learn how to actually operate to fill the rocket. Uh, we did have some challenges, but once we were able to take off and the spacecraft was able to then separate and go into its uh, lunar trajectory, uh, we were able to learn about the Orion, which is a spacecraft that will carry our humans to the moon. And so um, just learning and making sure that the systems uh, will have the, the ability to actually make the journey uh, as well as return. And so for us, one of the large things for us to, to learn was how the heat shield would perform, uh, making sure that we could actually re-enter into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the parachutes, I was watching that video and just uh, reminding me of what it felt like uh, when those parachutes deployed to know that we were going to be able to actually prove that the spacecraft would be able to uh, land and carry our astronauts back safely to the Earth. So for us, it was a test flight. Uh, as you said, it was uncrewed, and so uh, it was ringing out the systems, uh, making sure uh, that the avionics systems, that we were able to actually withstand the environments that we had to go through in order to make that journey uh, to the moon. Uh, we had uh, the, the close approach. Uh, we can actually uh, see how the cameras were able to look at the, the surface. We could understand uh, our abilities to actually make those traverses and and then to make the return journey home. So those it was basically proving out and making sure that the spacecraft is ready for its next mission, as you said, which will carry our astronauts uh, on their journey to the lunar orbit. So I want to ask you about that next mission, Artemis 2. But first, I should note that the Washington Post, obviously we cover space. We have a new series called The, the New Space Age that just came out this week. And so I encourage the, the viewers to check that out. Um, Director Weish, tell me a little bit about were there any surprises in how Orion worked or how the SLS rocket worked uh, in this first mission? Um, and then a, a quick follow up is when do we go again or when do you uh, send astronauts on a, a lunar orbit? Yeah, well, I will tell you the big surprise was how flawlessly everything worked. Uh, you know, when it's a first flight, you're expecting that you're going to have some issues and, and you're ready to do a lot of troubleshooting of anomalies. And guess what? We didn't have a whole lot of those. The systems performed just like they were designed and uh, demonstrated their capability. So I, I would say maybe that was a big surprise because even now, I just cannot believe just how great the mission went. Uh, so, uh, because of that, like I said, though, we do have to get everything back. Now the uh, spacecraft is back in Florida, and um, the avionics boxes, some of the subsystems that we'll need in order to go into the next spacecraft are actually being pulled out, and uh, we'll need to make sure that there are no issues with them. Uh, we will continue to do some post-flight testing. Uh, we have what we call um, instrumentation, uh, looking at the spacecraft all over it uh, during its journey and, and its return, as well as, as I mentioned, that very important heat shield that protects the um, spacecraft 
spacecraft when it comes back into the atmosphere. We have to study it, make sure that there are no issues or concerns. And so once we finish that activity and continue and finish outfitting of our Orion for Artemis II, then we'll be ready to put our humans on. And our expectation is, is that can be done within uh, a two uh, year cycle. So are you saying that perhaps as soon as 2025 or 2026 or do you want to give us a year oh no we're trying to get there by 2024 so you know we 2024 we're basically yes yes so we're trying to get there by november december of 2024 so a little okay. bit less than a complete two years as you know as you mentioned we ended up having to slip the launch a little bit uh but uh we've gotten our spacecraft back and so we think uh, we have a real good shot at making the window well, we uh, have questions from our audience. I want to read a, a question. This is from uh, Kuisi Rutledge uh, from Massachusetts, who asks, what are the current technology gaps that you think need to be filled to enable longer duration crewed missions? Yes, that's a very good question. So here at NASA's Johnson Space Center, uh, you know, we do study uh, the the risk and uh, think of what the mitigations are for doing uh, long duration human missions. So some of the things that we study and are trying to mitigate are um, done right now using the International uh, International Space Station. Uh, so uh, from a technology standpoint, um, how do we uh, make sure that our crews have um, all of the uh, the proper um, water? How do they have the proper environments for when they're on these long duration journeys? Uh, one of the things that we do on the International Space Station is reclamation of water, right? So we're not able to carry all of the water that we're going to need to go on a very long journey. And so we'll need to be able to reclaim the water that the crews use um, during uh, their activities. And so we have technology that we've been using to do that. Uh, another thing that we look at is how the astronauts will be able to thrive uh, in space. So how will their bodies be able to handle these long duration missions? So we study the effects of um, space radiation on the body. We also study the fact that there's not uh, gravity. And so what do we do to make sure that uh, with the loss of gravity, we know that there's bone loss, there's muscle mass loss. So what are the mitigations that we do for that? Uh, so these are the types of uh, technology and medical risk gaps that we work on on a daily basis. And we are doing that uh, every day using the International Space Station and using our ground analogs. Great. Well, I'm sure people have asked you this many times, uh, which is the why question. You know, why are we why is NASA doing this? Why does NASA want to put astronauts back on the moon? I mean, President Obama sort of famously said, you know, been there, done that. W what is your explanation of why this is an important goal for, for NASA? Uh, why is this worth the, uh, not only the, the money that goes into it, but just a lot of the institutional effort? And obviously there's a lot of risks too for the people who, who will do it. Right. So, you know, there's there's many reasons, but I would say from a scientific standpoint, um, you know, when you think about uh, lunar, uh, the lunar environment, what can you learn and uh, what we have learned? So here at the Johnson Space Center, we house the samples that we returned from Apollo. And so we're still learning from those samples today, but we went to one particular area of the moon. We have not gone to every area of the moon. So with Artemis, we're gonna go to the polar regions. We have, um, through our reconnaissance missions, understand uh, that there is uh, potential for us to be able to use lunar uh, ice or other volatiles that we could actually be able to learn how to make, whether it be propellant or use it to make oxygen uh, so that we could learn how to live on another body. Those are the things that we need to know in order to go further into the solar system. So to go to Mars or go even further than that. So that's why going to the moon, if you think about it, it's in our neighborhood. 
uh, you can get there in three to six days and you can get home in, a, in about that time versus going on a journey far out to Mars, which is a several months to get there. So using uh, the lunar environment as a learning environment, but also there are people that want to go there uh, and they believe that there's exploration. So you think about early settlers here in the US that uh, went uh, and they found gold and they found other things. So people are looking at it from a mining standpoint. There are other people that are looking at it from a commercial standpoint. How can I go and, and maybe have a lunar uh, hotel where other people may wanna go? So there's many reasons for wanna go. NASA, of course, you know, we're looking at it from a scientific discoveries as well as uh, us learning how to live and work in a, on a body that's close to home that will allow us to then move on to Mars. Do you think there'll be a permanent base uh, on the moon the way there is in Antarctica? You know, that's a really good question. Some of the things that we have looked at is we do want to have more of a permanent presence uh, in the lunar vicinity. And so what we're building today here at the Johnson Space Center uh, is a small habitat that will be in lunar orbit called Gateway. And that's going to allow us to have a place where we can go and we can then do lunar landings. We can have our human landing system go to the Gateway, go to the surface, come back so that we have a sustainable presence. Eventually build in the surface habitat and others that will allow us to be able to do excavations, come back to a, a home base, do studies. So we're, we're planning to build up the durations of these missions. And eventually, maybe someone would want to have more of a lunar base and have that. We can learn there, but then also have a, a jumping off point to pivot on to Mars. All right, I want to come back to that in a minute because it's, it's fascinating to see the architecture of NASA's human spaceflight program and the different elements of it. But a quick question here from our audience. Uh, this is from Charles Sullivan from New Mexico, who wants to know what scientific reasons, what scientific reason exists for manned spaceflight to Mars, considering the recent spectacular successes in robotic exploration and the threats to the astronauts health and safety on such a long and risky journey. That's an excellent question. You know, uh, we've been working really closely with our science mission directorate. And um, one of the things that we do know is that human robotic operations uh, working together will allow us to actually do further excavations, will allow us to be able to use the human to be able to assist robots uh, and making decisions, uh, finding and doing discoveries. Uh, it is, ex if you think about um, if I sent a, a robot out, you look at all of the uh, rovers that we have sent to Mars and they've been very successful. Um, but the amount of places that they can journey to is somewhat limited. If we had a human that was also there together, they could actually map out a, a, a path and go out. Uh, the human uh, has the ability to be able to do things that the robot can't do in terms of um, maneuvering things, to making a decision uh, to pivot. Uh, when you you know, going to Mars, a lot of people may not think about this, but there's a time delay between us and Mars. And so when you're doing that robotically, those are things that you're accounting for. Well, if you have the human there, they're able to automatically make decisions and to, to do things. So together, our scientists feel that that will be a very tremendous, very powerful way for us to be able to make those discoveries. Do, do you think that we will, or NASA will, or some space agency out there, or some international collaboration, will put people on Mars in the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Is that, how doable is that? I mean, you just, you know, it's a long way away, and you, you've, you've shared your thoughts about how hard it is to keep people alive in space, you know, the bone density loss, the, um, you know, just the, the challenges uh, of, of space. It's uh, in the radiation environment, the dangers with solar flares, the fact that people have to be able to be fed over a long period of time. Um, how realistic is it? I mean, I, obviously there are people like Elon Musk 
who that's the whole the whole dream of SpaceX is occupy Mars. How realistic is that in your opinion? Oh, I, I think it's very realistic. You know, I do think that as uh, uh, you know Americans, as um, Earthlings, you know, we have a desire to want to go and we want to explore. Uh, so we understand uh, and uh, what the ta- challenges are. And so we, as I said, we've studied this. We continue to actually make progress on a daily basis on uh, being able to come up with uh, the technologies that we need. And so uh, we're working on those systems right now. And uh, I do believe that uh, probably over the course of, as you said, you know, the next, you know, certainly uh, 20 years that we'll be able to uh, bring all of those to fruition. You know, we all kind of just stage. I, I'm I was sorry, just going to say, so so currently, um, you know, the the program that NASA has is Moon to Mars. It it and and so that is definitely what our goal is is to get to Mars. Has it been difficult for you and your colleagues at the Johnson Space Center, uh, or in NASA generally, or even among the contractors? that NASA has had these pivots in its overall strategy, which, um, you know, after the Columbia shuttle disaster, there was a reassessment of what we were, uh, what the program was doing. The decision was made to retire the shuttle, as you know. The decision was made to go back to the moon. Uh, then there was a decision not to go back to the moon, but uh, to focus on maybe a, a, a rendezvous with an asteroid. Then the decision was made to go back to the moon again. Has that been difficult and challenging in terms of uh, of, of putting together a coherent program? Well, you know, yes. So anytime you change the mission, if you change the objectives, the priorities, uh, and uh, some of that does require you to make design changes, right? Uh, just because uh, there's different requirements uh, going based on uh, where you're going to be going. And so that has had an impact on our schedule for us being able to make the progress that we want to. We were fortunate uh, that because with this last administration change, we've not had a change and we're still put moon to Mars as being what our strategy is. And so with that, um, it has allowed us to continue make, to make great progression uh, as we've gone over the past um, 10 years or so, which is a very good thing. But you, you're absolutely right, and you definitely know your space history. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've written, written some stories about it, um, but, but I, I'm just curious, was there some apprehension about what would happen to the, to the strategic plan when there was a change in administrations uh, after the 2020 election? Yes, of course. Yeah. So we, you know, wanted to uh, uh, be able to continue with the progress that we were making on Artemis. And so with this administration coming in and still supporting it, as you as you saw, we were able to go forward with uh, Artemis 1 and uh, and we're making great progress for us being able to to do Artemis 2. You're absolutely right. It's so the other amazing change in space is the commercialization of space. Um, and uh, so we have these private companies, uh, n- notably SpaceX, which is a big partner uh, for NASA. Uh, tell us about that relationship. I, I'm, I should know this, but to what extent would uh, the Artemis program rely on commercial contracts versus traditional contracts? And can you just speak a little bit about that relationship between NASA and SpaceX or or other private contractors? Yeah, so with the Artemis uh, program, we're using both uh, government-owned uh, projects, uh, so with the Orion, for example, and SLS, as well as uh, commercial uh, types of contracts. So uh, we have included, uh, as well as working with our international partners for their contributions. So for example, uh, one of the things that uh, we're looking at is in order for us to do the lunar landing missions, our first uh, demonstration mission, SpaceX uh, actually is going to be the provider 
for the human landing system. And so they intend to use right now today uh, their starship uh, for that purpose. And so they are fundamentally a part of that uh, overall plan. In addition, uh, the spacesuits that our astronauts are going to be using. NASA has done a lot of technology development on suits for deep space exploration. And we made that data uh, and all of the design, all of the testing that we've done on our spacesuits available to industry. And so we have uh, two providers that uh, have been uh, selected to have the ability to actually build our suits under a commercial type contract. Uh, right now, uh, the first has been let to a company called Axiom, uh, and they are going to be the commercial provider of our spacesuits for the human landing mission on the moon. I want to ask one more thing about uh, Elon Musk. You know, he's just bought Twitter. You know, he's constantly in the headlines. Uh, some people would view his behavior as a little erratic. Does that create any concern at all for NASA, which is such a kind of a traditional agency to, to have a partnership with someone who is a little, a little volatile the way, the way Mr. Musk is. So um, all of our providers, uh, whether it be SpaceX or Boeing or, or you know, Blue Origin, any of them, uh, we have agreements with and we have requirements that they satisfy in order for us to know that uh, they are providing uh, articles that are safe and that will allow us to have effective missions. And so uh, that's the relationship that we have. And SpaceX has been uh, really good. They have been providing our crewed launches from Florida on the Dragon going to the International Space Station. They have successfully met all of those requirements and have done multiple missions now for us. And so um, that's the relationship that we have. Uh, so it is very clear on our side, we have things that we have to do, they have things that they have to do, and we work together so that we're able to work our missions jointly. Great, thank you. Uh, let's pivot to the International Space Station. What is going on there? So Russia says, we're out of there in a couple of years, then what happens? And, and can you just address, I mean, it's been very interesting to see so many you know, geopolitical conflicts going on on the ground in space. It seems to be a different realm uh, that there's partnerships that have worked very well, regardless of what's happening in Ukraine or you know, Crimea or whatever. So I'm just wondering if you could address, what does it mean that Russia it may be uh, leaving the station in a couple of years. So, uh, you know, maybe just a little bit of a, a correction. Um, uh, so the International Space Station, as you mentioned, is a uh, peaceful cooperation of many countries working together and the Russians being one of them. And they have major uh, components that they provide for the International Space Station. Uh, there was a little confusion, uh, maybe lost in translation back in the fall of statements that were made, but um, the Russians are um, committed to working uh, with us on uh, the use of the International Space Station. What we're doing with all of the different countries that are a part of International Space Station is making agreements as to how long each of them will be there. The U.S. government was approved uh, by our Congress uh, to be able to go for 2030. And so we're very excited about that, uh, as well as some of the other countries. And so we're working right now with the Russians on what that date would be. But this earlier date that was discussed back in the fall, there was a, that was just a little bit of a confusion that happened. And, and so what we're doing right now is working with them on uh, what they believe is the right date in terms of their technology and when they uh, programmatically will be able uh, to, to commit to. Well, well, thank you for clarifying that and, and keep, keep us posted as to what's gonna happen with, this, with the station. Um, actually, 2030, would there, it, get an extension beyond 2030 or what is the scenario I mean, i've heard it speculated that it would at some point would have to be deorbited and i guess a, a controlled re-entry into the southern pacific ocean but maybe the private sector would want to take it over can you address that please 
Yeah. So if you um, look at the International Space Station, it has been a huge success, right? We have had our astronauts uh, living on board the International Space Station for over 22 years. Uh, so that's uh, a wonderful feat of uh, engineering prowess, right? To be able to have a facility and it's still going strong. We make upgrades to it. Uh, we uh, just recently did what we call um, a EVA, uh, a, a, a spacewalk outside the ISS to make upgrades to the power system. So we do that to maintain the systems. Then, and the Russians do that on their systems as well. They do same kinds of activities to make sure that we're keeping it up, kind of like you keep up your house, right? And uh, so for the International Space Station, though, we have uh, it's kind of anchored and said 2030 is the date that the United States wants to plan to discontinue use of the ISS. However, you know, technology, if it has the capability, then we'll see how that goes. But in the meantime, we have been working on a strategy of having commercial providers provide space stations. And so there are companies that are building and planning to build their own space stations and have those available in 2027, 2028. We want to have an overlap between when these commercial space stations would come online to make sure that they really are ready, there's no issues, prior to us looking at deorbiting, deorbiting our International Space Station. And so we would use then those space stations for us to continue to do those studies that I was telling you about, learning on technology, et cetera, that we need to, from a NASA standpoint, for long duration flights. Well, commercial companies will have other purposes. They may want to have it be used for a hotel, or they may want to actually use it for um, other research that they could do for organizations outside of what NASA is looking at research for. The intent would be for NASA to be one of many customers that would be a part of those space stations. So NASA is, is a, has a tremendous reputation for its engineering and science. How is the United States though generally doing with, with STEM, including the pipeline of new talent, including a more diverse workforce. I mean, you know, NASA famously, when you go back to the to the Apollo era, it's all the same, you know, white guys in their ties sitting at the consoles and all that. I mean, has, has NASA done better at getting a more diverse workforce? What can, what can it do to make sure that it has the talent it needs uh, to be competitive uh, in, in, in the global stage where you have many countries now doing space travel or, and, and with big space ambitions. Yeah, so you have many countries, as you mentioned, many companies. There's so many people that are interested and working currently in space. And as it is, it's like a, it is a renaissance, if you will, uh, for space. But I think it's most more uh, for many technologies. And so we do need to continue to work on and increase the STEM pipeline. But say that and again. that means we need to increase the STEM pipeline. Uh, so that we have enough workforce to support um, our activities within NASA, within our aerospace community, uh, with as well as other uh, technology uh, communities that are, are here. So what we have been doing is um, making sure that uh, for one, uh, we work uh, with uh, all the way down to kindergarten or even pre-K uh, with exposing uh, children to uh, STEM activities so that they can become aware of what it is to go into space or what would maybe interest them in science. Uh, we work with our universities, we work with community colleges because we have to have technicians in addition to uh, your four-year degrees. Uh, so that they can be a part of what we're doing through internships, through competitions, to get them to have hands-on experiences so that then they're excited once they get uh, kind of hooked on this business, they want to stay there. Um, but that's what we're doing today is we're working directly with uh, other uh, different partners, whether it be uh, Lego or uh, I think uh, Barbie recently came out with a, 
uh, a line of, of astronauts. So things where people can see that they can be a part of this. Uh, and I know for myself personally here in uh, this region, uh, I have made agreements with many of the universities uh, so that we can have exchanges uh, with the students, exchanges with the professors, uh, and uh, make it such that they are aware of the needs, the requirements that we have, especially around workforce going forward. Well, and that's with it, is, it is very exciting. Uh, thank you so much, Director Weish, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. And thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to the whole series. Yes. So uh, that's going to wrap it up. Uh, if you want to see what else is coming up, uh, check out WashingtonPostLive.com for the upcoming schedule. Um, I'm Joel Achenbach with The Washington Post. Thanks so much for joining us.